it's Sharon Kelly from the Berwick Public Library. This year, the state of Maine celebrates 200 years of statehood, and it gives us a chance to reflect on the history of Maine and where we are today. But it wasn't becoming a state that's important in our history. Maine residents have participated in the building of this country and the fighting of wars to protect it. Events like the French and Indian War, the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, and the American Civil War. Our next speaker, Dr. Michael Schroeder, is here to talk about one particular group of Mainers, the 29th Maine Regiment, who made engineering history during the American Civil War. Dr. Schroeder is a longtime member of the Civil War Roundtable of New Hampshire. He has his BS from the Illinois Institute of Technology and his MS from the University of Illinois. He has his PhD from the University of Maine, all in physics. Dr. Schroeder is also a veteran and has served on active duty in the U.S. Navy from 1979 to 1983. He also served in Desert Shield and Desert Storm in the 1990s. He is a native of Chicago, but now resides in Berwick. He is recently retired from the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard, where he was employed as a health physicist. Dr. Schroeder is also a member of the Berwick Library Association's Board of Directors. I would like to welcome Dr. Schroeder to the Berwick Library as he presents a damn fine regiment, the 29th Maine Regiment in the Red River Campaign of 1864. Good evening, my name's uh, Mike Schroeder. I'm uh, the former president and present member of the Civil War Roundtable in New Hampshire. And tonight's lecture will be a damn fine regiment the 29th Maine and the Red River Campaign of 1864. Now, the first thing some of you may say is, cursing already, Dr. Schroeder? But no, that's, the, if you take a look at the uh, spelling of the offending word, you'll see that it's the three-letter version of it, not the four-letter version. And it's meant as a pun, and we'll, you'll see what the meaning of that is at the end of this lecture. Uh, the other thing we're gonna, t we're gonna talk about is the 29th Maine and the Red River Campaign, and uh, most of you are probably scratching your head and saying, why the 29th Maine and why the Red River Campaign? Well, I would say uh, because they did something important uh, and uh, worth remembering. Uh, you might say, well, why haven't I ever heard of them? Well, the reason is, is the Red River Campaign is a complete and utter failure as far as any Union uh, effort in the war ever was. And consequently, after the war, it was not exactly well written about, well documented. Uh, they tend to, I think the only place you might know, people may know a little bit more about it, will be down in Louisiana. Uh, the 29th Maine uh, fought in, uh, in a number of places. Uh, and unlike the 20th Maine, they, they, they didn't do it at a, uh, at a, a uh, turning point of the, of the war. So the 20th Maine is remembered because uh, they fought at a turning point, and it was a well, it's a well-documented campaign. The Red River Campaign, not so much. Uh, but yet this regiment definitely does something that need, should be remembered. So let's talk quickly about the origins of the 29th Maine. Okay, if you take a look at this. Uh, 29th Maine was organized in uh, December 1863 at Augusta, Maine. It's unusual for most regiments in the Civil War in that the members uh, were mostly re-enlisting veterans from another unit that was being uh, demobilized, the 10th Maine Infantry. Okay, the 10th Maine had, uh, had been uh, organized in the spring, uh, or I should say the fall of 1861, and it was a two-year unit, okay. It was organized out of yet another regiment, when it was, uh, it was organized out of the 1st Maine Infantry, Okay, uh, which was a 90-day unit, which had been or, uh, mobilized in the spring of, of 1861. So these, these individuals who are coming up and swearing into the, 20, into the 29th Maine are enlisting essentially for the third time. Now, on my service, the Navy, we always say that the Navy stands for never again volunteer yourself. 
uh, these guys actually were volunteered three times. Okay, so uh, all I can say is uh, that you know they're 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 better men than I am. Okay, Gunga Din. Uh, let's take a look. The units, the 29th Maine's Colonel, was Colonel George Beal. Okay, here here he is, dapper looking guy, born 1825, Norway, Maine. Okay, uh, studies at Westbrook Seminary as a kid and as a as a young adult. Now the University of Maine. Uh, Pre-war, he had already been in the militia, and his unit uh, was mustered in as Company G of the 1st Maine Infantry, okay, in, in May of 1861. He was the company commander. Uh, they mustered out three months later at 5 August 1861 without having seen any action. Uh, they immediately uh, started to organize uh, another unit, uh, this 10th Maine, and he was, uh, he was appointed colonel. He spent two years as the colonel of the uh, 10th Maine. 10th Maine serves at battles of Cedar Mountain, Antietam, Chancellorsville, not small actions. Uh, and um, in uh, December, I should say in late uh, October 1863, they are demobilized after two years of service. He immediately sets out to organize yet another unit Okay, uh, he becomes Colonel of the 29th, and the uh, unit is organized on the, I guess, say, 17 December uh, 1863. Okay, well, let's go back to the unit here. Uh, they don't have much time. They don't we actually, some units would have gone off and trained for a while. This is a veteran unit, again, made out of people who, this is their third enlistment. Uh, they, they, go, they go down to Portland and board a ship, the SS Del Mole and one Feb 64 and arrived down in New Orleans uh, on the 16th of February. So a 15 day trip by steamship. Uh, today, this would be a 1600 mile, 24 hour car trip at 65 miles an hour. Okay, so these guys were doing between five and six knots the whole way. Uh, I was a little surprised. I thought it would take a little longer, but it just took them a, less, a little more than two weeks. They get there, you might think, hey, it's time for Mardi, Mardi Gras, maybe they'll get to see some, thing, some fun, but no, there's an act, there's, the people are getting ready for a campaign. Uh, they moved to Brazier City, Louisiana on uh, 20 February by train, and then they march up to Franklin, Louisiana, and we'll leave them there for a while, because this is going to be the jumping point, uh, j jumping off point for a, for, a, for a major campaign. Okay, now obviously, we, I mentioned Louisiana here, so you're getting the idea. That's probably where the Red River is. But let's ask ourselves, where are Louisiana and the Red River, and why are they important? Okay, this is a nice map of uh, Louisiana. And I think we all know that Louisiana is down on the Gulf Coast. It's in the center part of the Gulf Coast. Serves as more or less a tornado magnet nowadays. Uh, it's um, or hurricane magnet. Okay, same was probably true back then. But... Uh, Louisiana is a relatively low el elevation uh, state. Uh, it doesn't get more than a thousand feet way up north here on the Arkansas border. Okay, the high place is up here, more or less in Arkansas. Okay, up at the Arkansas border. And here's the Mississippi River running down. It forms the um, border between Mississippi and Louisiana for about the first half of the north-south travel and then it travels completely inside of, of Louisiana here down through Baton Rouge, New Orleans and out to the uh, Gulf of Mexico. The Mississippi River at this point in time is a major highway for commerce from the Midwest to the rest of the world. About 80 percent of what the Midwest produced uh, went to the uh, went out for export through the port of New Orleans. Okay and uh, it's a large river. It doesn't uh, change direction very quickly. It does look a little bit sinuous there, but those changes are over tens of miles. Okay, it's a wide river and a deep river, so large ships uh, can get far up the river. Uh, there are other rivers here. Two, two important ones are the Atchafalaya, which is right here, okay, and the Red River. The Red River starts up here. Okay, comes into Louisiana in the, uh, up here at the northwest uh, border. Uh, flows down, it's actually, flow, it uh, actually 
as its source up in New Mexico, flows through Texas for a while, comes down, enters Louisiana, and it goes through Shreveport right here, which is one of the uh, uh, important town that we'll see here in the, in the thing, flows down further through Natatoshis, uh, Alexandria, matches up with the Atchafalaya here, and flows out uh, down through the Atchafalaya. At 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 Having a bad day here today. Uh, there is a small, what is called a distributary, a river that leaves, a little branch of a river that leaves a, a river and never comes back to it, that leaves uh, the Mississippi in this area, general area here, and fall also flows into the Atchafalaya. So all three of those rivers, the Mississippi, the Atchafalaya, and the Red River are interconnected. Okay. Uh, one thing you should note about all this, note that all the major towns on the Mississippi are on the east side of the river. Grand Gulf, okay, uh, Natchez, Vicksburg are all on the east side here. Uh, Port Hudson, uh, Baton Rouge are all on the eastern bank of the, uh, of the river, and there's a, real, there's a reason for that. Uh, the banks of these two, of, of some of these rivers, are not at all both at the same elevation. In the case of the Mississippi, the eastern bank is actually a set of bluffs that enter up in here. Uh, they come in by uh, Vicksburg here. They've actually followed down the Yazoo River, and then they followed the, the Mississippi down into Bat 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 Baton Rouge's, and then they, they go off to the east. These bluffs are about 100 to 200 feet above the river. The western bank is at, is at river level. So if when you get a flooding in here, and it happens quite often every spring, the part that what gets washed out is the western bank. So all the towns are built on the east. Okay, and this has some very important effects here because most of central Louisiana here, between the River Tetch and the Mississippi here, is nothing but swamp. Armies are not going to be marching around on uh, roads in this area. They may travel by river if they can, but they're, if they're going to march in this area, they're going to either have to march to the east of the Mississippi or to the west of the River Tetch here. One more important thing to note about the Red River. Unlike the Atchafalaya and the Mississippi, uh, it wasn't the largest or biggest river in the world. In fact, people at the time referred to it as a large meandering creek, which essentially means it changed its course every couple of hundred yards. It wasn't all that wide at most places, and it wasn't all that deep. It was only really accessible for the entire length uh, during the spring and with the spring rains. So that's an important point and is, gonna is really going to be the, the nucleus, the, the reason that uh, the 29th is going to become famous indirectly at least. Let's talk about a little bit of the history of Louisiana. U.S. population at the time of the war, start of the war, 31,400,000, uh, about one-tenth of what it is today. Uh, 4.4 million blacks, Again, this, uh, but just about the same percent of the total population, about 13% that it is today. One well, interesting thing is there's 1.6 million Irish. Now, you might say, Dr. Shorter, why are you mentioning this? Well, a little, a little secret here, not really a secret. I'm a pretty lazy guy, so when I threw together this lecture, I did pull out some, uh, some of the slides from previous lectures. And this one was, I had used this. Uh, for another lecture that involved Louisiana, the uh, naval attack on New Orleans. The interesting thing about this large number of, of Irish in the United States at this time is that one out of five of all the people on the planet who had been born in Ireland in, in 1960 now lived in the United States. Uh, fun fact, it doesn't affect this battle very much, but literally this is the effect of the tomato, uh, tomato the potato famines they should have had a tomato famine. A potato famine in the uh, 1840s and 1850s uh, that the, it was a, such a mass outflow of people from Ireland. Louisiana itself, you'll note, has about 700,000 people, uh, almost exactly half of which are black, 49.5%. And if you compare that to a typical, more typical southern state, Virginia, maybe about a third in Virginia. Uh, one thing, another thing that's a little bit more, maybe a little bit unique about Louisiana is it's relatively cosmopolitan. There's about 81,000 people that are listed in the census as foreigners, uh, people from away, let's say, is what we call it today. Uh, about 5 or 6% are from away. If you compare that to Virginia, uh, it should be 10%. If you compare that to Virginia, where it's only 2%. 
So this is a little bit more cosmopolitan. Uh, at the same time, uh, Maine at this time had about 600,000 people, about half of the, the population it has today, and New Hampshire had about uh, 325,000. Uh, between the both of them, they had less than 2,000 blacks. But should be most of the people in Louisiana live down on the southern uh, coast, and they live near the town of New Orleans. You see here, New Orleans is the largest city in the south, and the sixth largest in the United States, with a total population of about 168,000. Uh, comparison, Boston was fifth largest, population of about 177,000. The thing about New Orleans that makes it important in the war is that it is, a, by Southern standards, a huge city. Uh, it is the uh, largest city, like I always said, it's the largest city in the South, and it has a greater population than the next five largest Southern cities combined. So Richmond... Charleston, Mobile, Mobile, excuse me, Memphis, and Savannah. If you add up all their populations together, it still didn't get anywhere near 177,000. So it's 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 uh, it's it's this is a large city, and had a, an immense number of people of uh, immense number of resources, banking, uh, shipbuilding, some industry, and keeping it in the uh, Confederate Confederacy was important, uh, not allowing the Union to take it over. All right. The war starts, of course, comes to, uh, the, to, to the country after the, uh, President Lincoln is elected in, on 6 November 1860. Uh, Lincoln was uh, the first member of the Republican Party to get elected president. The Republican Party had been created out of what was left of the Whig Party after the Compromise of 1850 had destroyed it. Uh, they, the party was sectional meaning it was mainly in the North, and it was an anti-slavery party, which meant not that it wanted to uh, destroy slavery, but that it did not want to allow it to expand any further into the territories. Uh, the Southern states saw this as a mortal threat and had been, uh, had been threatening over the years to secede from the Union, and when Abraham Lincoln uh, uh, finally is, a, a, not, is elected, uh, he, uh, the southern states uh, carry out their, their plans to secede. Uh, South Carolina goes just around Christmas, 1860, and then another six states, uh, all in the deep south, secede pretty much by the 1st of February. Louisiana will go on the 26th of January, and it'll be the fifth state to do so. After that happens, no one else secedes. This... Uh, the, uh, these deep south states form the Confederate states, and they're trying to attract more people, trying to get more states to leave the Union, specifically the four or five states of the middle uh, south. Uh, but the, they, don't, they don't leave right away. They, uh, Virginia and Tennessee, uh, the governors go to the, their legislatures, say, we've got to figure out what we want to do about secession. Uh, they, the uh, uh, legislatures will uh, uh, permit a convention to, to be called. They'll uh, pull together uh, groups of wise men, wise politicians, who will recommend something, and in both cases, they recommend secession, and they put a plebiscite out before the people, and in both cases, both Virginia and Tennessee, they vote against it. They vote to stay in the Union. Uh, on the Upper South, places like Kentucky and Missouri, it, it's, even, it's even more dramatic. In Kentucky, uh, I should say in, in Missouri, the governor says, let's, let's create a convention. The legislature goes along with it. The convention comes and it votes 99 to 1 to not even consider uh, put out a plebiscite on, on, uh, on secession. They just close up shop and go home. Uh, Kentucky, the governor tries to get a, a, a convention and the legislature says, no, thank you. We don't even want that. So two-thirds of the South, the middle and the upper part, where most of the population is, does not leave the Union until, of course, uh, April, when uh, the unpleasantries in Charleston Harbor occur around Fort Sumter. Uh, when the Confederacy finally fires on the fort, uh, Lincoln has, as by that time he was inaugurated in March as president, he... Uh, he says, okay, we got a, there's a rebellion, an act of rebellion now, and he calls for the states to uh, provide troops to put the rebellion down. And the four southern central states, Arkansas, Tennessee, 
uh, North Carolina and Virginia, which had all voted against secession, turn on a dime and say, we, uh, we, don't, we uh, don't believe that secession is absolutely necessary, but we're not going to fight against other southern states. And they secede based on that. So there will be 11 states in total that will secede from the Union. And both the North and the South in the end of 1860, middle of the 1861 till the end, <clears throat> are running around trying to uh, build up defenses. The, the, in the Confederacy, they look and they say, hey, the, the Mississippi River there is a big, again, is a big highway for commerce. If the North is going to invade the Western Confederacy, it's going to come down the Missouri River. And they start building defenses, mainly on the Mississippi, but everywhere else. And that, work, that goes on until February 1862, when a combined Army-Navy force under Brigadier General Ulysses S. Grant comes down the Tennessee River, or goes up the Tennessee River, captures first Fort Henry on the Tennessee. He marches his army 20 miles across uh, Tennessee to the Tennessee, uh, to the Cumberland River where Fort Donaldson is, and he captures Fort Donaldson. Now the Confederacy did not believe in defense in depth. Once he, these two forts were captured, Fort Henry and Fort Donaldson, both the Tennessee and the, and the Cumberland River were open. Were, there was nothing defending them. And the Confederate leaders looked and they said, oh my gosh, the Union Navy can now stop any kind of traffic it wants along these rivers. It can prevent anything going from one side of the river to the other. But the major problem with that was all, just about every Confederate army in the West it was the army was on the opposite side of the river from its sub base of supply. And the last thing you want to be is cut off from your supplies, because that's usually Das is Alles Dankeschön, as it goes for most armies. So they did not walk, they ran southward in, in the retreating, and pretty much it didn't stop for almost uh, three or four months. Uh, Nashville, Tennessee falls almost immediately. It's about the sixth or seventh largest city in the, in the Confederacy. New Madrid, Missouri, and island number 10. The second layer of Confederate defense on, on the Mississippi fall in late March and early May, April. And Memphis, the last layer of defense on the northern part of the Mississippi, falls in June. So it's not looking too good for the South, you'd say. Uh, at least in the, uh, in the West, people in New Orleans ought to be worried, except that when things go bad, they go bad, very bad. And in April 1862, Admiral Farragut's fleet shows up, for the, actually a fleet officer at that point in time, uh, shows up. We'll see, take a look and see who this guy is, because it's always important to see who, uh, who, uh, what these people look like. There he is. There's David Glasgow Farragut, first admiral in the United, in the United States Navy. He shows up off of... Uh, off of New Orleans in, the Gulf of, in the, the Gulf of Mexico with a squadron. That squadron enters the Mississippi River, and on the night of 24-25 April, it runs past the forts and captures, um, captures New Orleans. Uh, interesting guy. Uh, his uh, One little bit of his interesting history. Uh, his mother uh, had... Back then, they had things. We don't have these anymore. They're called epidemics. There was a yellow fever epidemic uh, in 1809. His mother had nursed uh, another naval officer by the name of David Porter back to health and then died herself. And as a, a way of thanking her, even though she was obviously had passed, uh, David Porter Sr. will adopt uh, uh, Farragut as a, uh, as a son. And we'll see that another Porter is going to show up in this. And there's something of a, of a brotherly rivalry here. Uh, one of the interesting things about him, he was appointed a midshipman in 1810 at the tender age of nine. Hey, anybody want to go to sea at nine years old? I don't know about you, but I think I was playing uh, like, you know, wiffle ball and things at that age. All right, let's, um, let's go on. Uh, by late 1862, the Confederacy has lost control of the bulk of the Mississippi. Okay, let's go back to this map here. Uh, Everything between, the only thing that they control any longer is between Vicksburg, Mississippi here and uh, Port Hudson on the, on, the, on, the, on the lower end. 
in late 1862, Grant's army is over in this area here trying to attack Vicksburg. Initially, it tries to come down this area here there where, the, where the railroad is. Again, you have to go in inland to get up to, uh, so you're not marching through swamp. But he got cut off. His, his, his army was attacked and his supply lines were uh, cut off by Confederate cavalry and he had to retreat back and he swore he would never allow that to happen again and that he would use rivers, something the Confederacy didn't have any Navy by this time, uh, to supply his troops and keep them uh, so he didn't have to worry about such things. And he ends up spending the winter over here on the eastern, on the western bank of the Mississippi, up on the levee, the one part that's above water and they have a miserable time there and he spends the whole the winter trying to find a way to get around Vicksburg. Down here in this area here between Baton Rouge and uh, New Orleans is the army of Major General Banks and the, the uh, it's called the Army of the Gulf. Uh, uh, Grant's army is called the Army of the Tennessee and he also wants to get up and clear out the Mississippi. You might say how did, why was that? Well 1862 had been a midterm election year. Uh, the, although the uh, Union had grabbed up most of the Mississippi, they hadn't gotten it all. And as a result, two years had gone by since the uh, people up in the Midwest had been allowed to send their troop, their, uh, not their troops, but their, their goods to, co to, to commerce down the Mississippi River. Uh, not surprisingly, they kind of soured on the wall, but war by that point, and you know it's hard to believe, but they actually voted Democrat in the uh, in the midterm elections. As a result, the Republicans almost lost control of the Congress, and they did not want that to happen again when this was after that election. They knew they had to do something, and they made it clear to both commanders, Grant and Banks, that uh, the Mississippi had to be their primary target in 1863. Let's go, let's see, let's go, what do we got here? Okay, we don't want to see that, okay? Okay, so what happens? Well, 1863 rolls around, both, both generals uh, are, have the same target, clear up to Mississippi. Uh, it's been made plain to, plain to both of them that they should be cooperating with one another. Surprisingly, that doesn't quite happen. Let's see what does happen here. Uh, Okay, here's the uh, 1863 campaign. If you take a look at this, here's Vicksburg. Grant is on the, on the, east, as a, on the western bank of the, of the Mississippi. He has to get onto the eastern side and onto the dry side if he's ever going to attack Vicksburg. He spends a great deal of trying, trying to find detours around or make detours. He'll, be, he'll dig canals. He'll... Uh, he'll uh, divert rivers into other areas to try to make a path around it. By March, he realizes that's not going to happen. And what he does is he gets the, uh, the no local Navy commander, Admiral Porter, that time just a fleet officer, to send uh, transports and naval vessels past the guns at Vicksburg. They run past the fort. Uh, they get to the south of it. He will march down the western bank with his troops. They'll get on ship. These ships will take them across to the west, to the eastern side, and they'll be high and dry on the eastern side before the uh, the uh, commander in Vicksburg, a, a gentleman from Pennsylvania by the name of Pemberton, even knows pretty much they're there. He never believed it. If you look in a Civil War uh, dictionary, you'll see. You look up Pemberton, it says "see inert," okay, because he just sat there. It's a incredible campaign. He was sitting there waiting for things to develop and watched, uh, watched things go to hell on him. What he did is Grant got over on this side of the river. He immediately takes off, and, and, and uncharacteristic for a, for a Civil War army. They abandoned their supply lines. He knew he was going to have to march across country here. He marches across country, living off country and what Lily can bring with them. They get up to Jackson, Mississippi, where these two, river, these two uh, railroads come together, and they cut uh, Pemberton's... Uh, communications and supply lines with the rest of the South. This, by the way, is the first hint that Pemberton gets that uh, Jack Grant is this far inland. Grant then moves inland, okay, down this railroad and forces uh, uh, Pemberton into the into the his uh, fort fortified lines around Vicksburg. The siege goes on and eventually the the city will fall. Banks. 
He's trying to, he's, he's constantly commu- trying to communicate with Grant saying, hey, I'm coming to help you. Why? Why does, why does he want this? He's a politician. And he wants to get in on what will be one of the major victories of the war. He wants some of the glory of it. But he can't, he's got problems here. He can't just march up the dry side of the river because there's a, there's a Confederate garrison here in uh, Port Hudson. So he wants to go around. He doesn't, he doesn't want to have anything to do with it. If he had marched up this way, same thing that happened to Grant the previous winter would have happened. These supply lines would have been cut. So he, the only thing he can, he looks around, he can't really march up the Atchafalaya. This is all swamp. He doesn't have enough transports to just sail up the river. So he has to walk. So they walk all the way inland to the Tetch. Okay, the river Tetch. The Tetch uh, River has a high bank on the, on the western side and the low bank on the eastern side. So that marks the boundary of a lot of this swampy area. He marches all the way up, about 200 miles, to Alexandria here on the Red River, hoping to find transports that he thought Grant might be using to get around uh, Vicksburg. No such thing. He finds the Navy there, and the Navy is remarkably uncommunicative. Oh, uh, we're, we're not exactly sure where Grant is. Grant went inland into Mississippi. We got no way of contacting him. So he marches his forces over to the Mississippi River. He gets Porter to move them across on, 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 uh, on warships, a few people at a time. He gets there and he looks around. He says, I've got hundreds of miles to go before I can get up to Vicksburg. I don't know where anybody is up there. Uh, Grant's not communicating with me for some reason. So he ends up going down and pushing uh, the forces back into Port Hudson, Confederate forces down there. He outnumbers them five to one, makes a complete bosh of that particular siege, and eventually uh, it does fall. On July 4th, uh, Vicksburg will fall, and on July 7th, uh, uh, Port Hudson will fall. Now, it just seemed, doesn't it seem to you pretty odd that these people didn't communicate, did not cooperate with one another? What was going on there? It just, it just seems very odd. Well, let's take a look at uh, just a few facts about these people. So, again, it's always nice to see a picture of these people. This is uh, Ulysses S. Grant, okay, uh, he, uh, this is a picture of him taken in 1864 at, at Petersburg, City Point, uh, Virginia, his City Point heads, headquarters. Uh, you see he's born 1822, he's a, a, a graduate of West Point, he was a professional soldier, about middle of his class, he fought uh, both, uh, with both armies in the Mexican War, both the, the original one under Taylor and then the one under uh, uh, Hancock, uh, he, um, he uh, re- eventually, after he stays in the Army after the war, but eventually resigns in 1854 uh, due to, quote unquote, intemperance. You've probably heard rumors that uh, Grant could drink, and yes, he could. Uh, he was on a um, unaccompanied tour. He had to leave his wife behind. He went to um, Oregon, of all places. Now, he, back then, it was a more sedate place. There weren't any riots, nothing, nothing to stir up some fun. So he 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 felt uh, you know lonely and uh, eventually drank a little too much. Had to leave. Now when the war starts, they run around looking for soldiers, uh, both sides, and uh, the pre-war records didn't necessarily uh, mean much. Uh, Grant ends up getting commissioned as a colonel. Uh, he will be promoted to brigadier general, and he makes major general on seventeen. February 1862 as a reward for having captured Fort Henry and Fort Donaldson. Remember that date, 18, February 1862, because here's his counterpart, Nathaniel P. Banks. Uh, born 1816 in Walton, Mass. Again, kind of a local boy, not quite local, but uh, went to school until the, the ripe old age of 14, okay, where he had enough ciphers and, 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 and learning uh, that he, uh, he, he went to work in a, uh, to help support his family, he went to work in local mills. And his first job was as a bobbin boy. And forever after, he was known as Bobbin Boy Banks. He, you know, he really adopted this himself to kind of show that he was a man of the people. Because this guy was not a, a um, professional soldier in any way. He never, he never had any professional training. But he was a great politician. He became interested in politics in the 1840s. Okay, he was a northern Whig. He was an anti-slavery southern uh, northern Whig, meaning again that he wanted to prevent extension of slavery into the territories. Uh, but uh, as things as the party falls apart, the Whig party falls apart. He and other people like Lincoln uh, 
uh, end up helping to organize the Republican Party. And in doing so, his politics begins to evolve, and he becomes more and more of an outright abolitionist. Okay? He was the Speaker of the House, 1856, 1857, and you can see his, he's got a kind of a haircut that looks like Nancy Pelosi's right there. So, you know, he's, he's definitely the uh, uh, Speaker of the House type material. Uh, he was governor of Mass from 57 to 61. Uh, he, he ran for uh, president, or at least, you know, campaigned to be, get the nomination. He didn't succeed, but he openly supported uh, Abraham Lincoln. And as a result, Lincoln w w rewards him for, for the loyalty and everything when the, when the war starts. And in May of 1861, he's promoted to uh, Major General. Now, this is uh, kind of sad because he's now, he's now senior to just about everyone else in the U.S. Army. If Grant and Banks actually ever got together, Banks would have been in charge. Now, Grant didn't like that idea because, you know, this is my toy and I'm going to play with it. He, he's the one who has the idea for the campaign. Uh, the the, the commander-in-chief of, of the Union Army at the time, a man by the name of uh, Halleck, uh, sort of hinted to Grant that he should stay away from Banks. And Porter didn't think much of him either, so they were all more or less conspiring to keep him out of the limelight. Okay, uh, this rank, uh, concern about rank, data rank, will show up later, but it's, it's, it's typical. This guy's got the rank, but nobody trusts him. Okay. It's gone. Okay, so there you've, you've got that. So by the end of 1863, the Mississippi's clear. 1864 rolls around. It's time to figure out what are we going to do next this year? What, 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 should we, what, what should we shoot for? And this is uh, another a little slightly different map that shows uh, the AOR here. By this point in time, Grant's army, which had been up around Vicksburg, has moved to Ch Chattanooga. It's going to go, uh, it's going to be used. It's been conglomerated with two other armies. It will eventually be used by um, uh, Sh Sherman to move down and attack Atlanta. And down here we have Banks with his, with his force. He's, he's got the only army force in the area, the Army of the Gulf. But up here and on the Mississippi, we still have the Mississippi Squadron under Admiral Porter. Okay, you take a look at that. And you look and you say, where would I go if I was going to uh, perform? We're going to have an 1864 campaign. And two little things, you know, show up immediately. Here's Mobile. Mobile, Alabama, third or fourth largest city in the Confederacy. It's an active seaport. The uh, blockade runners are running in, in there. Uh, it's got uh, some manufacturing capabilities. Uh, it's, it's, it's a booming, bustling town. Um, sounds like it might be a uh, good place to attack. It's known there's going to be campaigns in the other parts of the Confederacy. If you go up and you attack Mobile, you're going to draw, the Confederates are going to be forced to try to, they're either going to have to let it go or they're going to try to uh, uh, defend it, and they're definitely going to try to defend it. So you could draw off troops from these other campaigns, maybe make it easier for either Grant up in Virginia to slip past uh, Lee or uh, uh, Sherman to get, uh, get into Atlanta, okay? It makes sense to possibly go to Mobile. And then Mobile. But then you look around, there's not much else there. The only other thing is the Red River. Okay, why would anybody want to go to the Red River? Uh, one reason is, and one, one it goes back to uh, uh, Banks being a, uh, a, a major politician. Grant, uh, Lincoln had put uh, Banks in charge because he wanted to try to reabsorb Louisiana, reconstruct it into the Union. And he knew this guy was a good, very good politician, not such a good general, but a good politician, and he was the guy to do the job. The, what was left of the Confederacy in Louisiana was this area up in here, up in northern, northern Louisiana, and the capital at the time was Shreveport, a bustling town of 2,500 people. Okay, so it's one-third the size of modern-day Berwick. Okay, a bustling town, uh, so if he can get up here and, and throw the Confederates out of Louisiana, he can reconstruct uh, Louisiana into the Union. The other thing is, is the Red River is, although it's, a, again, a meandering creek, 
uh, large meandering creek. There are a lot of cotton, uh, cotton plantations in that area. It's one of the richest cotton areas in the south. And the north was hungry for cotton at this time. Uh, the linen mills up here in the northeast were running at about 25% capacity. Obviously, that was affecting the economy up here, and people were grumbling about that. And having learned from the 1862 debacle that when people are grumbling about the economy, you want to do something about it, they, there was some hope that if they could grab this area, they could send a lot of cotton to the, to the east and get the, the cotton mills running again. Last but not least, Shreveport is right on the uh, tra a trail called the Texas Trail that uh, people can leave from here, take a trail, and get over to Texas. You might say, good Lord, why would you want to go to Texas? Uh, you know, But uh, why they wanted to go there was not so much Texas itself, but its southern border with Mexico. Uh, Mexico had been uh, occupied by the French in 1861, and they had placed a uh, Austrian on the throne of, of Mexico. And it was being run basically as a, almost like a little French colony. The United States had, 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 uh, had uh, complained about it and told uh, the French in no uncertain terms they wanted them out of there. But there's not much you can do about it when you're fighting a civil war. The hope was that if you could get up into Texas and start funneling troops into there, the French might take us just a little bit more seriously. So you listen, you look at that cotton, uh, politics, uh, the uh, diplomacy. There's not a lot of real strategic reasons to go up to Shreveport. And there's a lot of reasons not to go. One is, okay, this area to the west of the Mississippi is now completely blocked off from the rest of the Confederacy. It's going to sit there and it's going to die on the vine. Uh, they're going to have to wait out the war. If the, so if the South if Confederacy wins, they'll be fine. If the Confederacy falls, uh, the, the West is going to go with it. There was no reason to go in there. Why stick, you know, a stick into the eye of a bear if you don't have to, okay? So there's one reason. The other reason would be um, the Red River is a large meandering creek. It's not exactly a super highway up into that area, and there's a lot of concerns that you may not be able to support an army up there, that the Navy might not be able to go up all the way up the river. The Navy had only gotten up to about Alexandria okay, in, in the prior year, and uh, it wasn't clear you could get up into there. So of all those things, what would you think they would do? Well, we can look at all this stuff, you know, Mobile, here's all the pros and cons. And let's just one last look here. Let's take a look at where the center of all the action is in the Civil War right now. Uh, up here at Chattanooga, uh, Sherman is going to be going down with three armies to attack Atlanta. Over here in Virginia, okay, uh, there's a number of armies. Uh, Grant will be making his headquarters with the Army of the Potomac, and they're all going to be fighting around um, Petersburg slash Richmond. Okay, there's going to be a lot of action. This is where all the action is. So you look in there and you say, well, wait a minute, where's, where's Shreveport? Where's the Red River? It's not even on this map. As, as far as things go, uh, the Red River is sort of like way out in left field when it comes to importance. So which of the two will you pick, Mobile or the Red River? Well, you already know the answer. They give the nod. The political and diplomatic logic outweighs the mere strategic uh, the mere strategic and tactical concerns. Uh, the Red River Valley campaign gets its nod. And you, gets nod. you may say to yourself, what were these people thinking? Well, part of this is there were a lot of people who were actually campaigning to go this way. Okay, let's take a look at the Union Battle of Order, order Battle. One of the things you have to do uh, is pick a commander for this. And surprisingly, there was one major general who was actually campaigning to be put in charge of this, uh, this campaign. William Tecumseh Sherman. This is William, you know, I'll make Georgia howl Sherman. William, war is hell and I intend to make it so Sherman. This guy's one of the better generals. You think, what was he thinking? Okay, well prior, you know, prior to the, to the Civil War, just prior to the Civil War, he had been the commandant of the Louisiana Military Academy, which happened to be situated up in the river, up on the Red River at near Alexandria. And he thought he knew the land well enough that he could get in and out of there quickly and actually can't, you know, carry out what they wanted to do. He wanted to go back, it's kind of like old home week. He wanted to go visit his old friends 
and show him his nice new uniform, okay? Uh, he's, a, he's quite the character. Just a real quick rundown. Uh, he had left the Army uh, in uh, the 1850s. He's one of the few conf uh, uh, Civil War generals who didn't have a lot of significant, a see significant action in the Mexican War. Uh, he's commissioned a, a colonel in uh, 1861. He actually fights at First Manassas out east. You don't think of him being that far east. Uh, he's promoted, in, you know, fights. Uh, various things. He's made a brigadier general in May 61, and he's given the Department of the Ohio, the Department of the Cumberland, I'd say. Uh, he's trying to organize the, uh, to attack the South at the same time the South is trying to defend uh, 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 New Orleans. And he, uh, he has a little mental problem. It's too much for him, and he actually acts to be relieved of command in November. Uh, he gets better pretty quick, and by December he wants to come back. But nobody, you know, a lot of people say, oh, yeah, you're the crazy one. Uh, why would I want to, you know, uh, take you on as, a, as, as, as an officer? Only one person would take him on, and that was the uh, commander at K Cairo, Illinois, a, a man by the name of, yes, you guessed it, Ulysses Grant. Uh, Ulysses Grant takes him on uh, when nobody else will and gives him meaningful work. And before you know it, uh, T Sherman will be like his right-hand man. Sherman would say at one point in time to, to Grant, when Grant was in a little trouble for uh, imbibing a little too much, he said, you stood by me when I was crazy. I'll stand by you when you, when, when you are drunk. So uh, he, will, sir, he wanted to go on this expedition, but Grant said, no, you're out of your mind. Okay, we got a better, bigger and better things for you to plan. Uh, so he's, he's assigned to a, a, go to Chattanooga and take the armies down to Atlanta. Uh, one other person had been uh, pushing uh, Sherman to take over this, this trip, and that would have been David Dixon Porter, Admiral Porter, the man who runs, who is the uh, commander of the Mississippi Squadron, Naval Squadron. Okay, uh, he is the son of the David Porter, who uh, had adopted Admiral Farragut, okay, when he was young. Uh, he is, uh, he was served under Farragut uh, at, at New Orleans and, uh, and later uh, other places on the Mississippi. And he pushes for this campaign because if the Union goes to attack Mo Mobile first, the Mobile Bay, Mobile Bay the, the squadron that's off Mobile Bay is Admiral Farragut's Gulf blockading squadron. So his brother is going to get even more glory if they go up and they attack on the Red River. It will be David Dixon Porter's force that will actually uh, take part in the combat. And there's potential for glory and whatever uh, there. When T Sherman says, uh, I, can't, I can't do it, uh, Grant won't let me do it, Porter starts to get a little nervous. He says, I, I, I don't want to be uh, in an expedition with Banks because he didn't trust Banks. He, he, he came right out and said he thought Grant, Banks would leave his, his, his ships behind. If his ships got in trouble, Banks would leave him. With, 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 would, uh, leave him. These, support, these two forces are supposed to be mutually supporting, but he believed that Grant, uh, Banks would, uh, would, uh, uh, would uh, if necessary, leave him behind. Uh, and to show you how, how important these personal interrelations are, um, uh, uh, Sherman says, you know, you're right. Uh, you shouldn't be left alone. And he lends Porter, believe this is incredible, lends Porter a, a, uh, a uh, army corps, a full army corps, two divisions of army troops, uh, telling him, hey, I'll lend you these troops. They're under your command. He gets Grant, Grant Grease, says, gives, they give strict instructions to the guy commanding the troops that he's not to abandon the ships. You know, but that he has to get back to Vicksburg and so that he can get over to the, for the Atlanta campaign by mid-April. So there's a deadline forming here. Porter wants to go, but he's got to have troops. The troops he gets have to be back by April 15th. Okay. Let's go on here. Okay. So uh, you've got Rear Admiral Strong's party. Da, da, da. Okay. Let's take a look at Rear Admiral Porter's uh, fleet. There's two squadrons. We already pointed this out. Let me go back up here. Uh, no, okay. Here we go. We've got two, two, two ships, two sets of, of ships here. Okay. Uh, what, what's the plan? 
Well, a simple plan of action is Admiral Porter's up here at Vicksburg. He'll embark with the 16th, the 16th Corps in transports. They'll come down the Mississippi River, trans, go through the distributary into uh, the Red River. They'll come up. They'll reduce any fortifications at the mouth of these rivers, and they'll come up and they'll, they'll get to um, Alexandria. Banks will start out here, down where we left the, 20, the 29th Maine, down in Franklin, Franklin uh, Louisiana there, and they'll start marching up on the western bank of the Tetch, because it's dry, and they'll come up, and they'll, they'll link up there at Alexandria, and the combined Army-Navy force will march up the river and take Shreveport. What could be simpler, as uh, Einstein said when he put forward his general field equations? What could be simpler? Okay, um, let's take a look at the two forces. Rear Admiral Porter's got 108 ships. Okay, that's a lot of ships of various kinds. He's got 10 ironclads. And if I were to ask you, uh, what do you think an ironclad is clad with? You would probably say iron, and by golly, you'd be right. Okay, this is the Cairo class, the most numerous class of ironclads on the river. Uh, uh, built, uh, by, uh, built by the U.S. Navy with U.S. Army funds in 1861-1862. Uh, take a look at the, the uh, dimensions. It's kind of 175 foot long, 50 feet wide, 6 foot of water. It's drawing 6 foot of water. Relatively shallow. Uh, it's it's, it's going to be able to go up western rivers. It's designed to do that. Now here's something that's really fascinating. Uh, two horizontal high-pressure engines, whatever they mean by high-pressure in, in the Civil War, it's probably like 15 PSI or something, okay? Uh, five boilers, 700 horsepower. Wow, that's a lot of power. Yeah, not really. Uh, my car has 200 horsepower today. A typical farm tractor has more than 700 horsepower. So, you know, if you think of a, four, of a, of a tractor, it doesn't move that fast. It does got some power to it. Uh, it's, but it's not uh, 512 tons either. Uh, so this thing's going to be slow. It's going to move around at six knots. Okay, for comparison's sake, okay, the to there's seven ships in this class, 700 horsepower apiece. All seven of them combined have 4,900 horsepower. Okay, uh, for comparison, the PT-109, an obscure ship from World War II, uh, commanded by an obs even more obscure Massachusetts Reserve officer, okay, had 4,500 horsepower and made 41 knots. Okay, it shows you that in 75 years between uh, the Civil War and uh, World War II, that naval art, naval science, naval engineering had gone a long way. Typical armament: three, eight-pound guns, pretty big guns. Uh, reasonably sized armor, two and a half foot, uh, two and a half foot, my God, two and a half inches of steel on the casements, et cetera. Uh, that's one set of clads. Let's try another class here, timber clads. Uh, three of these babies, and this, you'd say, well, if they're, you know, the iron clads were clad with iron, timber clads must be clad with, and you'd say timber, and I'd say correct. Uh, these were ships that were built before they were building iron clads. These are nothing more than commercial ships taken over by the Army and converted into warships and then given to the Navy. Uh, didn't have the, at that point in time, they were not clanning these things with iron. And what they did when they rebuilt them to be warships is they put large wooden bulwarks on the outside to act as armor. Uh, 170, 180 feet long, 36 foot wide. Again, six feet of water they're, they're drawing. Okay, uh, two high pressure engines. Again, three boilers, seven knots. These are the ships that saved uh, Grant at Shiloh uh, when he was attacked in the morning of the, the first morning of the battle. His troops retreated backwards toward Pittsburgh's landing uh, at, Pitt, at the river there, the Tennessee River there. The three chamber clads were there and they had huge guns. I mean, you see four eight inch smooth bores. Uh, they uh, sh were, were used to uh, uh, fire on the Confederate Army. The Confederate Army took one look at eight inch guns and said, nah, I don't know if I want to go over there and that slowed down their attack. Tin clads. What do you think tin clads might have been clad with? Well, I know you're all out there screaming tin. Well, you're wrong. Okay, this is a joke. This is a Civil War joke. 
kind of like my damn fine regiment. Okay. Uh, these things were clad with nothing. And consequently, they were like, you know, they were as vulnerable as a tin can. Uh, they, these are our ships that were taken over by the Navy convert, uh, um, and converted for use on the rivers. Uh, there's various, and send, there's over 60 of them. They're not really a class, but uh, we're going to talk here about the cricket. Uh, cricket was 150 foot long, 28 feet wide, draws only four feet of water. Okay. S, here's an east port. Uh, the reason this ship's important is it will be the hard luck ship of this, of this, uh, of this story. Uh, nothing goes right for the USS Eastport. And in the end, uh, it goes very bad. And something like the Neosho, a river class monitor. Notice um, all these ships are paddle wheel ships. That's because paddle wheels aren't particularly efficient for driving uh, ships through the water. Even then, they knew it was propellers were better. But the, uh, when you're in shallow water, these things don't go down as far down into the water, and they tend to be better for keeping the ship uh, from ground, grounding. Uh, nice big turret here. Uh, the Neosho will do something, and we'll see here later in this story. There's a first of its kind. Okay. So those are the ships. Okay. Uh, again, uh, Porter has 10,000 men of the 16th Corps. Here's their commander, A.J. Smith. Just to show you what the guy looks like, uh, solid officer. He'd been a he'd been a division commander and then a corps commander in the uh, Army of the Tennessee. Uh, goes back quite a ways. Indian fighter. Uh, nothing spectacular about him, but he's probably the best uh, Union uh, Army officer that uh, fights in this campaign. Okay. Go on here. Here we go. Uh, then you've got your uh, Department of the Gulf. The Department of the Gulf is, is under, again, Major General Bob and Boy Banks. Okay, he's, uh, he's got two corps, about 20,000 men, the 13th Corps and the 19th Corps. Uh, the 29th Maine is in the 19th Corps. They got one cavalry division. Uh, force, as, as we already seen, is uh, around New Orleans and is going to march overland to get to the to the campaign fight here what about the what about the their opposite numbers okay uh some pretty solid uh j people here uh here's lieutenant general kirby smith he's the overall charge of the quote unquote the department of the trans mississippi he was kind of a bossy little guy uh that by the end of the war the trans mississippi which is everything west of the mississippi river will be called kirby smithdom uh the guy is is he's he's there's nothing spectacular about him at least pre-war uh, he enters, he's born in 1824, class of 41, graduates in the lower half of the class, stays in the Army between wars. Uh, he was, uh, he's actually, by the time the war ended, he'd been in the, he'd been in the uh, Army for 20 years, and he'd had absolutely, he had two promotions. He made it all the way to captain, E3, okay, O3, excuse me. Uh, and just to show you how fast promotion can come during the Civil War, Okay, uh, he moves over to the Confederacy, resigns his U.S. commission, goes over to the Confederacy. He's immediately promoted to major. So he's up to one rank, to 04. Three months later, they make him a brigadier general. He skips over lieutenant colonel and colonel to become a brigadier. So he skips up to an 07 from an 04. Uh, about, what is it, about four months after that, they make him a major general. So now he's an 08. Okay, and a year after that, he'll be an 09 lieutenant general. You'll notice most of the Union generals never get above major general. In fact, only one does, uh, Grant, lieutenant general in the war. Uh, that's because uh, it was been traditional that nobody could outrank George Washington, and George Washington had, was the only, uh, I think he, I forget what his actual rank was. It may have been lieutenant general, but they, they, they definitely would not allow anybody to outrank uh, George Washington. So the, um, there are no generals and, or, or lieutenant generals for the most part in the Union forces, but the Confederacies just, the Confederates just went uh, a whole hog and redid the rank structure. Here's a, a very important guy, Richard S. Taylor. Uh, he is probably the best general the Confederacy had west of the Mississippi in the entire war. This man is a non, he's like Banks in that he has no military training. Okay, he went to Harvard, stayed there for two years, and then he went to Yale, 
you know, you know, uh, everybody thinks that's important. I, every time I've seen these guys, they all put their pants on one leg at a time. But, uh, you know, he went to Harvard, he went to Yale, he graduated from Yale, no scholastic honors. But his father was Zachary Taylor. Zachary Taylor was one of the major, was one of the two generals that uh, had fought uh, the uh, Mexican War. Uh, he would later become the 12th president of the United States. Uh, beyond that, okay, he had served, uh, Richard Taylor had served as his father's aide de camp, a voluntary aide de camp during the Mexican War. He was essentially the guy's uh, chief of staff. And if you're going to learn how to run an army, that's probably the way to do it. So he got excellent training helping to run his father's army during the Mexican War. When the Civil War came along, he was, you know, he's a southerner. Uh, he ends up uh, trying to become a military, uh, another volunteer aide de camp. This time, uh, to believe it or not, uh, Braxton Bragg. My God! Now there's a guy uh, of all the people to be serving as a, as a, as, a, as, the, as the aide de camp for. Braxton Bragg never saw a battle that he didn't retreat from, even if he'd won it. Uh, he he ran away. I mean, I shouldn't say he ran away. He retreated after Perryville, which he arguably won. He retreated after Murfreesboro that he arguably won. He retreated from Rosecrans and gave up Chattanooga. Uh, it goes on. The only battle he ever won and didn't retreat from was Chickamauga. Uh, he pushed uh, the Union Army back into Chattanooga. And there's, there's a story where one of his scouts comes up to him and says, General, he says, General, the Union Army is demoralized and it's in full retreat. And uh, Bragg looked at him and said, how do you know what a demoralized army in full retreat looks like? And the uh, soldier is supposed to have said, General, I've been, I've been serving with you for the last two years. So it's a little, you know, more, some more Civil War humor here. Okay, uh, this guy is going to do most of the fighting in this campaign for the Confederacy, and he is uh, top notch. Uh, he's supported by Sterling Price, who's up in Missouri. He, he's got the uh, small, he's got the command, subcommand up in the Arkansas, Missouri area. Uh, he, he has about 5,000 troops to uh, uh, Taylor's 10,000, and he's going to send what he can. He's also got his hands full with a third invasion that's coming down from, uh, from Missouri, Arkansas, but that's outside the scope here. Last but not least, John B. Prince John Magruder. What a great, you know, nickname. Prince John, born in 1807 in Virginia. He graduates from the U.S. Military Academy in 1830. Little local color, 1843-1844. He serves at the Hancock Barracks in Holton, Maine. Why are there barracks for the U.S. Army in Holton, Maine in the 1840s? Well, it turns out that the border between uh, Canada and Maine was a little bit fluid back then. Okay, it would finally get decided, I think it was by the King of Sweden in the late 1840s, uh, uh, drew the border at, 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 in our favor. Uh, <clears throat> but before then, there, there were actual troops up there watching the Brits. Okay, he fights in the Mexican War. He resigns his commission, uh, 17 April 1861. He ends up in uh, Virginia. He's on, he fights on the peninsula, the peninsula campaign, uh, all through uh, 1862, early uh, up to June. Uh, he fights at uh, Williamsburg, Seven Pines, and Seven Days. He is the officer who was initially in charge on the, on the peninsula. He, uh, he uh, served uh, at, uh, he had a, a, a fortification at Yorktown, Virginia, the Yorktown from the Revolutionary War on the peninsula there. He had tricked, uh, he's the one who delayed McClellan by tricking McClellan into believing that his 10,000 man army at Yorktown was actually uh, bigger than uh, that, uh, bigger than uh, McClellan's hundred thousand man army. McClellan wasn't that difficult of, to uh, to trick. Uh, there was a saying at the time of the war that he could see two Confederates where there were only one. He had bad vision. Okay. Um, uh, after the, that, uh, he got transferred out west. Apparently, uh, Lee didn't really care for him, uh, so he, he transferred him out of the army in Northern Virginia. He ends up in Texas, and he doesn't do badly there. He actually recaptures Galveston, Texas from the U.S. Navy on New Year's uh, 1863 with a cost of only 26 casualties. But <clears throat> he, he has about 15,000 men spread out in New Mexico and Texas, which is not a small area. He will be funneling men to Taylor, too. Last and most importantly of these people, 
William R. Boggs. What a great name, huh? This guy is not, this guy is, is, is something. Born 1829, he excels in, in math and science at the uh, U.S. Military Academy. This guy is almost a physicist. He's almost in that top layer, you know, of society. He's almost a physicist. Okay, uh, he's, uh, he was four of 52 in his class. Uh, that class included McPherson, Sheridan, Schofield, and Hood. And those names are, you know, if you know anything about the Civil War, those are heavy hitters in the Civil War. Uh, he served mainly as an engineer or in the ordnance branch, you know, technical kind of stuff. Uh, he resigns his commission upon secession, and he serves as primary, initially as an engineer. He's the one who completes a lot of the fortifications on the East and Gulf Coast for the Confederacy. And he serves as an engineer, as an engineer and ordnance officer, again, for Braxton Bragg. Poor man. But in 1863, they, they promote him to a brigadier general and send him off to be um, Kirby Smith's chief of staff. And fortunately for Kirby Smith, his chief engineer. Boggs creates a lot of fortifications that really don't get used. There's a complex of forts down on the Red River to try to keep the Union Navy out. There's a, a very large fort, uh, Fort de Russie, uh, which has like 40 foot thick walls that he builds, again, to keep people out of the Red River. He builds a piling dam to keep people out of the Red River. Okay, he's a set of forts uh, up at Grand Accor to keep people out of the upper Red River. He's done a lot of fortification stuff, but most importantly, this guy prepares to obstruct and divert the flow of the Red River. He's gonna play God and move the Red River from its banks oh, and, and send it somewhere else. And this is one of, is the most important thing this guy does in the war probably, and is the subject of the story that's gonna make the 29th Main shine. Okay, so he's got this formidable set of, of, of stuff there. So let's get back to Alexander, let's get back to the fight here. We're back at the beginning of March, okay? And everybody, the, everybody's getting ready to start the campaign. Banks units, the 13th and 19th Corps, again, the 19th Corps is the one with uh, the 29th Maine in it, finally assemble around Brazier City on the 7th of March. So the, um, the uh, uh, 29th, uh, 29th Maine actually got there a little early, and they don't even leave there and start marching northward until the 8th of March. Now, remember, the, 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 everybody's aware that there's a time limit here. Those, that troop, the set of troops, not with Banks, but with Porter, have to be back in, you know, with, with Sherman by roughly the 15th of April. So we're, okay, we got, what, five weeks here to get this campaign going and, and going. And he's just starting to walk up to, to uh, uh, Alexandria now. And, you know, it, okay, so that's fine. Uh, but it's going to take a while. Uh, Smith's Corps embarks with uh, Porter's fleet on the 10th of March. On the 11th of March, they arrive at the mouth of the Red River. On the 12th of March, they ascend the Red River and start to uh, uh, clear out the uh, Confederate, uh, for, uh, uh, Confederate um, obstacles. 13 March, they capture the forts in the Yellow Bayou. 14 March, they destroy Fort Derussi which only had 100 defenders. You could imagine these 100 guys are looking out over the ramparts and they see, you know, 10,000 men coming at them. They might have said, eh, might be time to leave. Okay, uh, Admiral Porter's force clear out the piling dam. So everything that uh, poor Boggs has done down there on the, on the lower um, uh, Red River in Atchafalaya is destroyed in three days. Um, and... Um, Smith's Corps, you know, uh, attempts to destroy Fort de Russie, but it's too rugged. They try to blow it up with point-blank cannon fire from U.S. ships. Nothing will destroy the thing. It was really well built. Uh, by the 16th, the U.S. squadron has entered Alexandria, and the town is occupied by the 16th Corps. Good work. Here's a picture of Fort de Russie. But, you know, what was left? Big, big fort, earthwork. Okay. Uh, the thing is, before the Civil War, most of forts, permanent forts, were uh, masonry objects made of bricks and stone. Uh, <clears throat> when you fired on those with the older style smoothbore, uh, you know, solid shot cannon, the stuff would just bounce off. Now, but now you've got rifled cannon, you've got sh uh, exploding shells. 
the stuff will dig in, it'll blow up inside the wall, the wall will crumble, and masonry forts fall apart. You hit one of these, these earthen works with one of these, these shells, you blow the dirt up, and it falls right back into the same pile you had before. You know, it just kind of mixes it up a little bit. So it's very difficult. These, these, these were preferred, in a lot of ways, after the war to uh, masonry forts. There's Fort de Russie, and here's the Union fleet at Alexandria, uh, Louisiana. Nice looking. Note one thing. Note all, this is the east, this is the uh, western bank. You don't see a lot of trees over here, but on the other side, there's an awful lot of trees on the other bank, the eastern bank. And that will be important later, that the eastern bank has lots of trees. You think, what is that all about? Well, we'll see here in a bit. Anyway, by the 16th, Major General Taylor is well aware that the campaign's underway. He starts to gather his forces. Initially, he was going to batter them in Alexandria, but the Navy was far too fast for him. He goes to General Kirby Smith. Kirby Smith says, let's execute the plan that we have to divert the Red River. The object being that if there's no water in the Red River, nobody can sail a ship up it. Okay, and certainly the Union Army isn't going to be able to use it as a supply line. And how do they plan to do this? Well, it all f uh, focuses around this ship. This is the only Confederate ship on the Red River, pretty much. The SS New Falls City. It's a big, big river packet. 300 feet long, relatively long. 39, 40 foot wide. Okay, Sat, draws seven and a half feet of water. Probably a little bit too much for the Red River. Uh, you might say, why is this ship important? Well, note the 300-foot length of this ship. And there's a lot of places on the Red River where the river isn't 300 foot wide. Okay, and what's the plan, you'd say? What, what, okay, so that's nice. What's the plan here? Well, let's take a good look, because this is fascinating. There's an area called the Scorpini Pass, or the Scorpini Cutoff at this time, on the Red River. Now. This was prepared by the Department of the Interior. Uh, they show you today's river, a real picture of today's river, and then they show you what the river looked like in 1864. What an awful map, okay? But you can see a little, there's a little bit of a better sketch here. The river, you notice the river really does change course very quickly. Notice that it's much, it's much less wide than it is today then, okay? The river came down, and initially, back before the war, it would go, it went through this little, this real hairpin turn here called the Scar, this was the Scarpini Pass. Okay. Uh, this was a little, might have been Scarpini's Peninsula, I don't know. But it came down like this. And before the war, a local uh, entrepreneur, local um, uh, plantation owner, had dug a little canal called, and it was called by this time Tones Bayou, that went from the base of this turn here. And it went down at high water. The water would flow over this, this, this little canal and would go down into this little river over here called Bayou Pierre. The point of that was you could bring barges up here, get yourself up into the Red River, not have to go all the way down the river to do it. Okay. Later, the river cut itself a new path. This became like an island. Okay. The river didn't really want to flow in this direction anymore. The, the uh, locals had balked up that, that part of it and had built a dam down here to keep any water from flowing down from the Red River into Tones Bayou. Okay, what would happen is during the, during the spring, they would flood, they'd let some water through this dam, this bayou would fill up and the, 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 uh, brand, the, uh, they could bring barges up and uh, get them into the Red River that way. So this is a nothing. This part is, 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 is uh, nothing. Now, it's just stagnant water for the most part, stopped by this. Well, what um, Boggs intends to do is he's going to take the New Fall City down here. Again, it's 300 feet wide. He gets to a point that's a little less than 300 feet wide in the river, and he jams the ship in so that the bow is up on one bank and the stern's on another. Before he did that, he had filled it to capacity, pretty much, with dirt, and debris, so that it was very deep in the river. What you've got there is the beginnings of a dam. It gets there, he then, he then cracks the keel so that the thing actually sinks, whoosh, okay? They open up the, the, the interior and they start throwing more dirt in. 
And before you know it, you've got a very nice dam made out of an old ship down here on the Red River. Well, what happens when you put a dam in a river? But the water begins to back up. The water started to back up. You started to get more, you know, almost like a reservoir in here. And what would eventually would happen is the river would either cut a new canal channel around the dam or would wash the dam away. But we don't want that to happen. So what they what he did was they then went down here and they blow Hotchkiss's dam. The water is very is now super high over here and it's got an outlet. It comes down this old the back way down this old channel into Tones Bio and into Bayou Pierre. They've diverted most of the Red River's flow into Bayou Pierre. What happens is as time goes on, this dam gets better and better. This dirt starts to plug up any holes and stuff like that, so less water goes down this way. And there's, there's water is cascading down this old ravine and clearing it out. The water flows faster and faster down it. Less and less water goes down the Red River, and the water starts to go down. Admiral Porter starts to notice this. Hey, what's going on with the river here? It's not rising anywhere near as fast as it should, given all the rain. But he figures, oh, it's, you know, it's just the rain. Uh, it, it'll come back up because, you know, it does every year. By the 26th, uh, by this point in time, uh, uh, Porter's already been waiting for 10 days. Okay, the army of, Banks' army finally arrives in Alexandria for the last half of the trip to Shreveport. Now, by this point, remember, they've got to get that Army Corps back by mid-April. They've now got about three weeks to do it. So they're in a big hurry. They're not thinking too clearly. Even Porter is, you know, we got to get going here. Now, he knows he's a little worried because he can't, the water can't get too low because there are these rapids in Alexandria. Okay, Ale he's down here at Alexandria now. There's two sets of rapids here. If, what it is is, there are two areas where there's very rocky ledge, doesn't get worn away by the water as well as the sandy bottom does. And the water is relatively shallow here at these two ledges. Okay, that's not important as long as the water's high enough. You can get over those shallow points and get upriver where it's deeper. Okay, the sea starts to get deeper, both up and below. But you gotta be able to get over that. Okay, uh, what will happen is, is when he goes across to go up north, the water's up about this, this high line here. It's more than enough to go up above the river. But while he's away, things are gonna go the wrong way. Anyway, they make their final dash to Shreveport. Okay, 26, Brank says, let's go. He gets, an, he gets yet another order from General Grant. Grant tells him, I want those troops back. He, he says again, I want the troops back by the 15th and do not enter Texas. I think he was scared that Banks would go charging off into Texas and get lost. Porter splits his fleet into two parts. He'll take one, only one half behind the deeper part. The deeper uh, can't get up. He doesn't think it should go up above uh, Alexandria. And he takes the shallow stuff up north. They must start moving north and it takes them about two days. They, tra they travel about 50 miles and they get to an area called Nanatochus. Uh, and Grand Accord. Let me uh, get over here. We'll get the map if I can find. There it is. Okay. Let's take a quick look here. Uh, here's Alexandria. Okay. They're, they're here at Alexandria. They go up to Grand Decor and here's Alexandria. They go up river to Grand Decor and Anatochus right here. About halfway to their final destination from Alexandria to Shreveport. They arrive there. It takes them about two days. It's not too bad. They've now got about two weeks before they got to put the put the put the um, put the, the the core back on the on the road to uh, Vicksburg, the the, the, the uh, Smith's Corps. Okay, so they arrive. Okay, uh, General Taylor begins to uh, uh, marshal his troops about halfway between Grand Corps and uh, Shreveport. Okay, uh, on the fourth. They're getting ready to leave uh, Grand Accord to match up. They, okay, so now they've got what? Week and a half. They finally leave, they're finally getting ready to leave Grand Accord, Natosha's area. And Banks makes yet another bad decision. He says, geez, these roads along the river stink. They're kind of like dog paths, okay? They're not very big. Uh, this is one of the reasons we're not moving very fast. 
And the locals tell him, hey, there's a, ro there's a road about 25 miles inland called the Nanatochus Sharivport Stagecoach Road. A little bigger, you can move faster on that. <clears throat> Banks decides to take the army, separate himself from the Navy, okay, and march up that river. Now, this is not the best decision in the world. If he gets into trouble, the Navy's not going to be there with its big guns to rescue him. On the other hand, if the Navy somehow gets into some, some trouble, okay, <clears throat> the army isn't going to be there to bail him out. So he's, he's making this decision, okay. So they agree they're going to meet in Springfield, which is about two-thirds of the way up the river, on 10 April. So Banks and uh, starts up the river, uh, starts up the road, and he does yet another dumb thing. He, he's worried about his, his, his supply train. So he, he says, I don't want to leave it in the rear where the Confederate cavalry might get it and where the Navy could protect it because I can't protect anything with the Navy now. He sandwiches his, his supply train between his two corps. Now this is where all his beans and bullets are. They're in these, you know, he, if, if this rear guy, if this supply train gets lost, they can't eat dinner that night. So it is important. So he decides he'll sandwich it between these two cars. But the problem is, is that the, the supply train is about four or five miles long. And now the 13th and 19th Corps are, are not mutually supporting one another. They're separate. If one of these cores gets into trouble, you know, maybe well, like well, something might happen, uh, the other one isn't going to be able to come up as fast as it might be, be able to to support. They march up the road. Eventually they get to a place near Mansfield where Taylor has been setting up his Confederate defense. And he's picked this L-shaped field about three miles south of Mansfield to set a trap for for Banks' columns. He's going to stay in the woods north of this, of this field. And what he hopes to do is to lure a small part of, of, of Banks' army into this area and then attack it with his entire army, crush it, and even up the odds. Because he's only got 10,000 men right now and uh, Banks has got 20,000. So he needs to do this. Okay. And this is exactly what happens. The cavalry comes up into this L-shaped field, and they notice there's cavalry on the other side. And the cavalry won't let them through, okay, because they don't want them to see the armies in the woods. So they see this. They say, hey, this is suspicious. They call back to the 13th Corps, which is the, the leading corps, and says, hey, we're running into support here. I think something's going on. Bring up your men fast. So they bring up the, they bring up the army pretty fast, and the 13th Corps falls in to this clearing, but doesn't go any further than the beginnings of the clearing. They spread out into the clearing, and they call up the 19th Corps. Okay, but the 19th Corps, of course, can't come up fast because they're five miles away, and there's a traffic jam between them and the, and the 13th. Okay, the 19th Corps advances up the road and just starts to arrive when at 4 p.m., General Taylor realizes the Union forces are not going to give him, aren't going to give him the what he was hoping for. Uh, you know, a nice little you know, blunder where he could, he's going to have to attack what's there. And so it's about 10,000 for 10,000. But the Union forces are in this L-shaped uh, 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 disposition. And that turns out to be bad because the Confederate forces hit this, the, 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 uh, the curve in the L, this joint in the L, and the troops there, get uh, when they get, do get attacked, are taking fire from two directions at once. The Union line collapses. It falls back down the road, and eventually uh, the retreat is stopped when they meet pieces of the 19th Corps, and they manage to stop the Confederate uh, forces. Uh, that includes, by the way, the 29th Maine. The 29th Maine fights on April 8th. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Pretty much a clear-cut Confederate victory. Uh, okay, here's here's the here's the here's the setup. Again, as the Union came up this road, they deployed into this L-shaped field, and the attack came down and hit them here. And if you look like that, this guy right here, he's got some people coming down like this and attacking him in the front. There are people coming like this, and they're attacking him from the side. So you're getting a lot of fire. Uh, from two directions at that and the four units that are right at this apex they lose about 50 percent of their men That's the Battle of Mansfield Okay, that evening 
Grant looks, uh, Banks looks at what's going on. He says, let's withdraw the army toward Pleasant Hill. Okay, so he's got about a week left, he, but he's going to retreat back 25 miles to, uh, to uh, Pleasant Hill, where the 16th Corps, the, the troops that were with, um, with uh, Porter, are waiting for, you know, are, are deployed there. So he, he falls back on them. Union suffered about 2,200 casualties, and uh, most importantly, uh, Major, the K-9 escort of the, uh, mascot of the 29th Maine is killed in action. Uh, Major had been with the 10th uh, Maine prior to joining the 29th. He'd been on the duty for almost three years, and if you read the unit history, they seem more upset about that than anything else that went on in this campaign, okay, that the mascot had been killed. Confederates lose about a thousand people. It should be pointed out that the battle is a bit controversial and that it appears the Confederates took people, people who had been paroled uh, from the Gettysburg campaign, which means they'd been sent back home but were not supposed to fight until they were exchanged, gave them new names and sent them back into the army. Uh, not a good thing to do because if they get captured and the Union finds, figures out who they are, they can be shot. Okay. Anyway, the Union retreats to Pleasant Hill, 1.30 a.m., Taylor has some reinforcements arrive. He's got almost 20,000 people now. He says, we're going to crush them tomorrow morning. He sets out a plan. He, they wake up at dawn. They go to attack. There's nobody there. They, they, they realize that the Union Army has retreated, and they start following, and they don't regain contact till 5 p.m. Okay. Uh, the Union line is set up so that there are some covering troops. They don't want the Confederates to know that the 16th Corps is there, in addition to all these other troops. The Confederates attack, okay? They push back these covering troops. The left side gets pushed back further than the, than the right, okay? It was planned that way. Uh, the Confederates who are attacking the Union left think that they have they've created another stampede, Okay, and they take a sharp turn to the, to the left to come up on the other half of the, of the Union Army and attack it from the flank. They do this, they start to move that way, and out of the woods burst the 13th Corps and the, 6th, the Union 6th, 13th and 16th Corps. They get taken in the flank, and now they're running away. So there's a second battle. This time the Union wins. Okay. Let's take a look at this. Uh, there are about another, there's another 1,300 Union casualties here and 1,600. So between the two battles, there's about 6,000 casualties. Okay, and here you see the setup of the battle. Okay, again, there, was these light, there were these groups that were out here in front. As the Confederates come through, these are just screening forces. They move backwards. The 29th Maine is up here with the, with the 19th Corps. Uh, the, the Confederates push these people back and think, aha, they're gone. Go uh, up this way to attack what's left of the army. As they do that, they let their flank, uh, their flank exposed to A.J. Smith and the rest of those people. They come bailing out of the woods and push the Confederates back. So the Confederates lose one. Okay. 10th of April, you got four days left, okay? Uh, the Corps commanders start arguing. They tell, they tell uh, Banks, let's stay and fight it out. We can win this. We just push these guys back. We can win this. They don't realize we got three. We still got more troops and everything. They do. Banks says, no, we got to leave. You know, and the, the, his Corps commanders are so disgusted. They go to Smith, the guy who isn't in their chain of command, the 16th Corps commander, and ask him to arrest Banks and take command of the Army. Smith smartly, you know, this is Kane mutiny stuff, okay, uh, Smith declines, okay, he says, no, I don't think so, uh, and just as this is happening, <clears throat> Porter finally gets up to the, up, farther up the river to where this, he finds this dam that looks like a, like an old boat up the river, and he suddenly realizes, oh my goodness, they've dammed up the river, that's why the river's been falling, but he doesn't have any time to do anything about it because, hey, he gets a message from Porter, a grant, uh, he gets a message from a bank that says, we've met a reversal, we're all headed south. So he turns around and he's got to go back down the river. But guess what? What's been happening to the river level? It's been going down and down and down. So it's not going to be quite as easy to get down the river as it, is, it was to get up it. 
So they retreat. Okay, initially there's a small naval battle, you put that in quotes, between the United States Navy and Confederate cavalry. Uh, what happened is, uh, again, uh, the Union Army wasn't supporting the Navy that well, okay? Uh, the Confederate cavalry managed to get themselves inscranged on the banks where the uh, Union Navy had to pass. And they, 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 fortunately, at this point, they didn't have any artillery, and they fired rifle fire at these ships as they went by. Well, you know, the sailors just got under, under, you know, under, under hatches, you know, and they, you know, they, I'm sure they were, you know, trading insults about one another's mother and, and things like that. Uh, uh, but, uh, the, so they're shooting. But one of the interesting things about this is the, the general that was leading the Confederates uh, by the name of Green is killed when the USS Osage, this is it right here, it's a Neosho class ship, uses a periscope to aim this, this uh, turret. Now, the, the, the interesting thing about the turret is it's got two 11-inch guns in it, and they load it up with what's called canister. Now, if you're not familiar with what the canister is, it's essentially uh, uh, tin cans full of like buckshot and, sh you know, and uh, sh uh, little bullets and all sorts of crazy things. What happens is when you fire the gun off a canister, the can disintegrates, and you turn the gun, this huge 11-inch bore cannon, into a big 11-inch bore shotgun. So they managed to aim this, this the device, uh, the, the turret, with this periscope. They fire it off, and they kill this Confederate general. They decapitate him, essentially. And this is the first known use of a periscope in naval, in naval combat. So there's a first right there. Okay, so this isn't working too good. Uh, they managed to get past all of their, all of their, their uh, funnels, the, 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 the smokestacks are just riddled with holes, but nobody really cares. Uh, but they get to, um, on April 12th, okay, that's on the 12th, so you get two days left. Here's a picture of the naval, the naval battle at Blair's Landing, it's called. And you can see here, there's your Osage, and there's one of your, uh, this is one of the uh, timber clads. They're fighting it out with the cavalry in the woods. The cavalry should have got their sabers out and attacked. You know, it would have been a great idea. Anyway, so you, you think, how can things get worse? We're retreating. We, we, we're going to miss, we're not going to get up there in two days. So they're retreating. Okay, April 14th comes and goes. They get all get to Grand Decor. Again, half the way back to, to Alexandria and they decide it's, it's, it's time to leave. But the water's been falling. Uh, and uh, Porter looks at this situation and says, I've got to get these ships down river. I'm going to send the deepest draft ship, the USS Eastport first, okay? Get it down and the runs well, because it's six foot three inches of water. Well, okay, big ship. Unfortunately, again, the Confederates, have been uh, they're unsupport they're unsupported by infantry. The Confederates can do whatever they want. They had managed to plant some naval mines in the river. The Eastport gets two miles down the river, spits one of these mines, sinks, and absolutely blocks the river. None of the ships can get past them. So now they're stuck upriver, and they've got to raise this ship and get it downriver. And you got to do this while the, these, conf these, these Confederates are shooting at you with rifles and things, and eventually artillery. So it's a long, arduous process. It takes them ten, five, day, five or six days to get this ship uh, floating again. They try to get it out of the way. They try to get it moved down river. It goes two miles, and it wedges here. And then they get it out of that, and they move it another two miles, and it wedges. And it takes a while, but it, by the 26th, uh, Porter is absolutely disgusted. He sees that the water is falling, and he doesn't think the Eastport's going to get there. And he hay orders the ship blown up. So the biggest ship in the in the in the Union fleet is lost because they can't get it down river. Yeah, well, at least they have the, the the cork is out of the bottle. The ships can get further down. You would think, right? You'd think what could go wrong now? Well, there's a second naval battle. This time. It's not just cavalry, it's field artillery, and a lot of it. And this time, it's nothing as, as, it does not go that well for the Union Navy. Two ships are lost eventually. Uh, Admiral Porter is in the cricket. The cricket takes hits, 
and one of which uh, severely disables the engineering department. There's nobody down running the engineering plant. Admiral Porter himself has to go down and run the ship's plant to get the ship down river. The captain's steering the ship. He's down in the, he's, he's now the engineer. He goes all the way from Admiral to uh, Grease Monkey in one swell foop. Okay, they finally get, they limp into Alexandria. And can you guess what's going on there? The water is so low that it's now down where this blue mark is. And guess what there? Guess what? You can't get past the rapids now. There's not enough water to get his fleet past Alexandria. He's stuck again. He's caught. What's a person to do? Okay, well, uh, excuse me, trapped. Let's go back here. What, what are they going to do? Well, he says, maybe we can light and ship. So they start removing the armor and the weaponry in order to, you know, get rid of weight so that the ships will float. But it's not a really hopeful thing. Fortunately, for Porter and Banks who are looking at this and realizing that Porter may have to blow up all of his ships to keep the Confederates from getting them, Colonel Joseph Bailey, the real hero of all this, comes along. Here he is. Born 1825, again, not a military man. He's trained as a gets a civil engineering degree at the University of Illinois, one of my alma maters, okay? And he moves to Wisconsin. Uh, usually they move from Wisconsin to Illinois, at least they did when I was a kid. And he becomes a civil engineer there and a lumberman, and he successfully builds lots of dams on Wisconsin rivers to, for use by lumber by the lumber raftsmen. Because they got to make these, they get the lumber all together in these big rafts, and they got to take it down river. It's got to float, and sometimes the water gets a little low. He knows the tricks to make the water rise. Okay, so he goes to, uh, Colonel Bailey goes to um, Banks and, and Porter and says, hey, I'll build, you some, I'll build you some dams. A DAM, you know, like a dam fine unit, we're going to build you some dams, and that'll make the water rise. And if you're in, you're in this deep and things have been going this bad, you'll believe anything. So they say, go for it. So Bailey goes out and looks. First, he looks at what materials does he have. Well, he looks at the eastern side, the western side of the river, the side that uh, Alexandria is on. And there's no trees there, but there's lots of rocks, lots of sand and dirt. And there's a lot of buildings you could take apart, too, okay, and maybe make a dam out of. So he looks around for somebody to use that material. And he finds the 97th and 99th USCTs, U.S. Colored Troops. These are purposefully, uh, purposeful engineering units. They build roads. They build, you know, build, uh, they build bridges. They, you know, put together railroads. They do all sorts of things. And this is just another construction project to them. <clears throat> they say, great, you go build. You, the 97th, 99th, go build dams on the on the western side of the river on the eastern side of the river he looks around there aren't any rocks there aren't any buildings to take apart but there's a hell of a lot of trees there lots and lots and lots of trees so he says well we'll look for a unit that's maybe got some experience got some lumberjacks and experience he looks around and what does he find but the 29th maine the 29th maine had quite a, a few people who, in their civilian experience, had been lumberjacks. And let's face it, you know, if you lived in Maine then, there were trees everywhere, you had probably gotten good with an axe. So the entire unit is put forward, is put forth to building a, a, the, uh, lip, a piece of a dam from the uh, eastern bank using wood. So what do these dams look like? Here's what the USCTs are building. It's called a crib. Uh, it's more conventional design. They're going to they're, they're going to pour put in iron bars in the form of a box, you know, the outline of a box, and then they're going to uh, fill that the ed, outside of that box in with the wood and everything else they can get. They're going to build an open box, open top box. Okay. When that box is done, they'll go on to the next thing. But the next so other people will come by and they'll start filling that box full of dirt and stone and pieces of buildings, or anything you get your hands on, and to fill it up and make it a bit watertight. And you'll just leapfrog your way further. On the other bank, you've got the, um, you've got the 29th Main building this, what's called a tree dam. You start out, <clears throat> and here you see one or two logs, 
and then you start putting uh, more logs at right angles, kind of put it so it's got a little of a slant to it. Then you put another topping on that, and then right on top of those, you again, make it a slant, a slant, the thing starts to get higher and higher. It's got a bigger and bigger slant. Okay, you while you're doing that, you're throwing dirt and rocks and everything on top of it to make sure it doesn't wash away and keeps the water from, from getting to it. So the 29th main is building this dam out of trees. Let's take a look at this. Okay, here's where the 29th main is. Over here on this side, again, the USCTs are here, and they start building down at the uh, just up above the lower rapids. The idea is you will build dams. They will come together like this, okay? As, the, as that opening between the two dams gets smaller and smaller, the water is forced through a smaller and smaller, again, smaller and smaller slot. The water has to rise to get through. So you start to cause the water to rise. The water backs up. The hope is it gets high enough back here to allow you to get over these these rapids you bring your your, your ships down and they're going to go through the gap between the two dams in a sluice like thing okay uh, it gets harder and harder but they they're, they're doing it. eventually they they take some uh, rafts they have they fill them up with material to get them deep in the water and attach them to either end of these these two dams to make it even more narrow Okay, and it starts to work. It takes about a week, but the river comes up, and by 8 May, <clears throat> almost a week after they started this, lighter draft vessels are able to cross the rapids. On 9 May, part of the dam fails, and it looks like they're not going to be able to get the river up high enough over here with just this dam. So Boggs uh, steps in and says, let's just go build some wing walls at this end. And it takes them only a day and a half before they get the water high enough here that they can sluice down past these rapids into the river and then sluice out the other side. Okay, by 13 May, everybody's over these rapids. The, the New U.S. Navy is saved. Here's a picture from the Union History showing the uh, 29th Maine for 29th Main Union history of them building this dam. They, 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 they didn't they really consider this to be very spectacular, I guess. Here's a picture from one of the illustrated uh, newspapers of the time. Again, here's, here's the 29th Main's piece of this dam. Here's the USCT Cripstone dam. And you see there's a, there's a big gap here, and the water kind of sluices out through that, that gap. And the, there's a, what looks to be a K row class. Uh, iron clad, clad with iron, going over the thing. Here's another picture. I think this one's a little neater. Uh, you really see that there was a lot of water going on oh, through that little slot there. Okay, uh, so each of these units ends up building about uh, initially the uh, wooden bridge on the on the lower side. The wooden dam was about two thirds of the dam, and the cribstone was one third. And the upper part of the dam, it was exactly reversed. The cribstone was about two thirds of it. The wooden dam was about a third of it. So each of these, each of these units, each of these groups built their own dam, more or less. Total dam. Here's what remains. This is fascinating. Uh, in the 18, um, 1850s, 1980s, there were a, a, a severe drought in the Red River area. The water dropped so low that you could begin to see what was left of these dams. Here you see, this is the Cribs Dam. You can see some of the, of the wooden hewn uh, beams. Apparently they weren't using trees to mount line this. I got a feeling they were, I know for a fact they were dismantling homes to get materials to fill these dams with. I don't know what the local, I don't think the locals liked it. Anyway, here again, you can see some of these, uh, these obviously hewn timbers. Uh, and here's a debris field that was, of the, was the material that was in a lot of those cribs. Okay, here's uh, the other side of it. Here's the tree dam. Here's somebody standing on some of the stuff they found. They've excavated it. You can actually see the trees. Here's, uh, again, some uh, uh, quite a few trees that have, have uh, become visible because the water has become so low. And again, here's he's standing on this. These guys found about 150, evidence of about 150 trees. If you work out what these guys did, it's, it's, it is kind of amazing, okay? 
Uh, my calculations show that the uh, USCTs probably excavated, moved, and deposited about 2,000 tons of material. And this is, you know, they don't have steam shovels. They don't have backhoes, okay? <laughs> These guys are doing this, you know, with um, muscles and animals, okay? On the other hand, the, U, uh, the 29th uh, Maine, I figure about 700 trees. They've chopped down about 700 trees in about a week. So about 100 tre trees a day. I don't know about you, but I might have. Maybe in seven days I could have chopped down one tree. I mean, I, I, I mean, these guys don't have, again, no skitters, no chainsaws and stuff. These guys are doing this manually. Okay. Yeah, just a tremendous amount of work. But it does the job and it saves the Navy. Okay. Final stages, Banks. Finally gets out of Alexandria just to thank everybody in town. He burns it down. Okay, 16 May, uh, Taylor tries to block him one last time, but they just, they, they sidestep one another. Uh, by 18, uh, Taylor tries to make one more attempt. It fails, and the battle's over. Uh, Banks gets greeted by ERS Canby, Major General ERS Canby, uh, a man who is um, actually... Uh, lower in rank is, is, is uh, junior to him, but he's got a set of orders from Grant that said, uh, why don't you hand over command <laughs> to this guy and uh, write some reports. And so he spends the rest of the war writing reports. Canby is, is known, uh, sadly, he's the only uh, uh, g uh, general officer uh, killed uh, in, in the Indian Wars after the war. He'll be the only one killed. Okay, let's see. Well, let's, 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 what's the evaluation? Well, the evaluation is, this is a freaking epic fail of vast proportions. Union forces failed to meet a single one of their objectives. The two sides end the campaign in the same position vis-a-vis -vis one another as when the campaign started. It's almost like they should never have done it. The combined casualties of the entire campaign are a total of 11,200 killed, wounded, missing. The USN loses eight ships total. Compare this to 2,200 casualties for the 20-year war in Afghanistan. Half of the, of, the, of the casualties over 20 years that we've taken in 20 years in Afghanistan, they, these people take in about a month. And if you scale it based on the, uh, the, the population, which is a tenth of what it is today, this is more like 100, 112,000 people, all in a month. All in a month where there's at least two other campaigns that are piling up casualties even faster. Okay, these people were built of a lot sterner stuff than we were. We are. Union forces secure only 3,000 bales of cotton. The 16th Corps is delayed in returning to Sherman's army by over a month. All, nothing but debacle, debacle, debacle written all over it. Just a, no wonder nobody wanted to write about it after the war. Yes, I was at the great debacle. You want, here are my mistakes. Nobody wants to write that kind of stuff. Consequently, we don't see a lot about this campaign, and what the 29th Maine did, did or the, the USCTs did, only gets a little footnote in most, in most books. Let's look at the individual level. Brigadier General Boggs, the Confederacy, devised a brilliant engineering scheme which successfully blocked the Union advance by diverting and draining the Red River. The damage will not be outdone until 1868. It takes them three years after the war to finally repair all the damage these guys did. Colonel Bailey devised an even more brilliant engineering scheme, which used available materials to save a major portion of the USN's Mississippi Squadron. Colonel Bailey is the winner of the 1864 Battle of the Nerds, okay, in some sense. Although I gotta say, I don't think Boggs lost anything. The 29th Maine and the 97th, 99th USCTs successfully implemented Bailey's scheme through much effort and hard work, constructed two sets of wing wall dams in 10 days, Absolutely damn fine units. And there's, there's, there's the joke, I, I promised you. Okay. What happened to the 29th Maine later? Uh, they stayed in Louisiana until mid-July. They got sent back east to Washington, D.C. They ended up fighting in the Shenandoah Valley for most of 1864. Major battles, Berryville, Winchester, Fisher's, Fisher's Hill, Cedar Creek. They were at all of them. After that, they mainly stood uh, provost guard. Okay, they had provost duty in Washington, D.C. during the Grand Army Review, which means they didn't march in that little, that little boo-hoo. 
uh, unlike the rest of those troops, they stayed on active duty for a year. They moved down south to Georgia and South Carolina and essentially did occupation duty for till June of uh, 1866. It was all over. The regiment lost a total of 237 men, two officers and 40 enlisted killed or, or mortally wounded in combat, and four officers and 191 due to disease. And it shows you that uh, two-thirds two -thirds of all the Civil War casualties, the 620,000 people lost, two-thirds of them were killed by disease. And last thoughts. Overall, a bit of Maine Civil War history that deserves to be remembered and sadly isn't. Are there any questions? If not, uh, I will call it a day.